Hello viewers. Good day to all of you. This is Dr. BK for you and today I am going to deal with the soul of the foot. The soul of the foot I will be actually discussing in two parts. So in the first part of today's lecture on the soul of the foot we will be concentrating mainly on some introductory aspects then followed by that cutaneous innervation of the sole of the foot a brief overview of the skeleton of the foot then coming to the muscles so of this the first three layers of muscles of the sole of the foot and before that muscles we will be discussing in detail about the plantar aponeurosis okay then followed by that the first three layers of the sole we will be actually discussing today now the first let us try to understand how actually our sole is designed so it is this surface of the foot or the whole body we can tell it is this surface is going to touch the ground or the surface of the earth while actually we are walking okay so we walk with our foot and the sole of the foot actually touches the ground now this sole of the foot is actually modified for walking as well as weight bearing walking on all types of surface not only even or smooth surface but even uneven surfaces okay so not only for walking but also for when you are jumping and you are running so mainly for walking it has to overcome the inertia of the weight of the body and naturally what happens is we have to propel forwards we are not quadrupeds where we can balance on all four limbs we are bipedal animals so we actually have to walk only with the two limbs and the center of gravity always what happens is tend to push forward we tend to fall downwards so we have to counteract this one bearing the weight of the body only with the two limbs we have to propel forward so because of this our foot is designed and that is why it has a unique shape it is not we cannot call it as it is circular or quadrangular or a square rectangle but it has a unique shape the sole of the foot now mainly what happens is the skin is thick we all should understand that the skin of our sole is actually designed to walk barefooted okay invention of so many footwear which we use today is all later developed or man made but basically what nature has given the natural protection for the sole of the foot is the skin so the skin is mainly thick or glabrous skin and what happens is it is devoid of hair follicles so naturally no sebaceous glands lot of sweat glands are there so now you should be knowing why actually our sock smells if we don't wash it properly or regularly okay so mainly it is present with lot of sweat glands the skin then what happens is there are also flexure lines on the skin you see lot of uh, but not as like the palm of the sole then the skin is attached to the underlying plantar aponeurosis so thereby what happens is it gives a grip to the skin so that you does not slip away when you place your foot on any 
surface then deep to the skin you have abundant fat and this fat you can see again more concentrated near the heel region the heels posterior surface of the foot and also near the head of the metatarsals so these are the points where the foot is going to make contact the place where these bones are going to make contact at these points you can see lot of fat again because when you put your pressure on the ground the foot so naturally some of the structure should be protected especially your vessels and nerves and of course even your muscles so fat actually gives a cushioning effect so thereby we don't feel pain during our normal walking procedure then what happens is the muscles are actually multi layered they are not present in a single layer they are actually present in many layered so that again adds to the thickness of the soft tissues of the sole of the foot then if you look at the foot if you carefully observe the foot it is not complete flatly touching the ground not all parts of the foot are actually in contact with the ground only certain parts are in contact with the ground and that is because the foot is arched okay so the arching of foot itself is a separate topic which i will be dealing as a separate lecture okay so with this introduction already you have a fair idea about the skeleton of the foot if you look at the skeleton of the foot you are able to see the uppermost bone is the talus then deep to the or below the talus what you see here is the calcaneum and then you see the navicular the three cuneiforms and the cuboid then you have the metatarsals and phalanges so basically all the bones when you compare it to the upper limb the size is larger then if you look at the carpal bones of the wrist they are present in two rows proximal and distal rows but they are present one below the other and on the same plane but here the bones do not lie on the same plane they are mostly irregular bones and talus at one level then calcaneum and naturally your cuboid and navicular at one plane so that is why you have ankle joint then below that you have subtalar and then you have the intertarsal joints okay so they are present this is at one level and then these bones are actually at another level and then you see the metatarsals not all parts of the metatarsals are actually touching the surface okay so not all bones touch the ground this is because of the arching only if the arching of the foot is there the naturally what happens is the foot will be actually firm as well as resilient so what happens is due to the compressive forces acting on the foot the body weight it actually compresses it is getting compressed and then it should become resilient come to its normal position this will be possible only when the bones are actually in the arched manner and they are assisted by the ligaments and the tendons then if you carefully observe the metatarsal you will be able to see two sesamoid bones which are present within the flexor hallucis brevis muscle the ball of the great toe we tell the ball of the great toe if you look if you carefully observe your sole of the foot the ball of the great toe you can see a mark 
because that is the maximum pressure is actually felt there and plantar flexion of the great toe is very important during walking so this is one main support in the skeleton of the foot the second one you are able to see this projection on the calcaneum which is actually called as the sustentaculum talli this is actually called as the sustentaculum talli where actually the head of the talus is articulating so this is actually support from the below the whole weight while standing what happens is resting on this part okay so supports the head of the talus especially while standing so sustentaculum talli and below that what happens the spring ligament runs below the sustentaculum talli which is again one of the main support ligamentous support for the foot okay so mainly the bones are actually bigger in nature they are present at different planes and not all the bones touch the ground there is an arched pattern and two things you should remember is sesamoid bones on the head of the metatarsal and the sustentaculum talli and finally the spring ligament so with this we will pass on to the soft tissues of the sole of the foot so first thing is the skin as i told you it is a very thick skin the skin is not thick at birth but apparently it becomes thicker as the infant or the child grows because during birth what happens is the child does not walk or stand on its foot but when the child starts to walk after the 10th month onwards and slowly when it makes contact with the surface the skin gets more roughened okay and attaches to the plantar aponeurosis deep to the skin what you have is the superficial fascia which is filled with fat so between the fat the skin and the plantar aponeurosis between the fat there are fibrous strands which is actually anchoring the skin to the plantar aponeurosis so that the skin does not slide freely it gives a firm attachment and so naturally we don't slip while we are walking so apart from that it is a thick skin so no sweat sebaceous glands and hair follicles we have numerous sweat glands flexure lines are seen to some extent they are actually the place of sites of the skin movement but not very prominent as we see in our the palm now coming to the cutaneous innervation of the sole of the foot the heel region is mainly supplied by calcaneal branch of the tibial nerve the heel region is mainly supplied by the calcaneal branch of the tibial nerve then the medial part is mainly supplied by the medial plantar nerve including the medial 3 and 1/2 digits the lateral border of the foot and lateral part is actually supplied by the lateral plantar nerve and by the lateral 1 and 1/2 digits okay so the main these three nerves only they supply the medial calcaneal nerve the lateral plantar nerve and the medial plantar nerve okay apart from that a very small area a strip on the medial side by the sural nerve and by the saphenous nerve on the lateral side is by the sural nerve and medial side is by a saphenous nerve very minimal contribution okay now these digital branches which actually supply the 3 and 1/2 is by the medial plantar nerve and the 1 and 1/2 is by the lateral plantar nerve they also supply the dorsum of your digits corresponding to the distal phalanx so next uh, deep to the skin superficial fascia has a variable amount of fat and deep to the fat what we see is the plantar aponeurosis the plantar aponeurosis is actually a modification of tendon of plantaris muscle but it is not continuous with the tendon 
it is triangular in shape and it has got a central part and it has got a lateral and a medial part now some books don't agree with the lateral and medial part they tell or call it as the plantar fascia whereas only the central part is actually considered as the plantar aponeurosis so we will also go by that view so if you look at the plantar aponeurosis posteriorly the central part posteriorly is attached to the medial tubercle of calcaneum okay attached to the medial tubercle of calcaneum then what happens is proximal to the head of the metatarsals it actually divides into four slips sorry five slips only the palmar aponeurosis divides into four slips where the thumb is free here actually it is five slips for the five toes then each slip will again divide into superficial and a deep strata now between these slips there are also transverse fibers which protects the digital vessels and nerves which are running in between these slips okay so what happens is each slips divides into two the superficial strip it actually merges with the superficial transverse metatarsal ligament and it is attached to the skin superficial transverse metatarsal ligament and it is attached to the skin whereas the deep slip merges with the deep transverse metatarsal ligament each deep slip again divides into two okay so each deep slip again divides into two and they merge with the fibrous sheath of the flexor tendons and with the deep transverse metatarsal ligaments in between these you have the web space which is actually filled with the fat and the digital vessels and the nerves are actually running in this web space so central part posteriorly attached to the medial tubercle of the calcaneum divides into five slips and these each slip divides into superficial and the deep strata superficial strata merges with the skin at the deep strata what happens is is actually dividing again into two splits into two merges with the fibrous sheath of the flexor tendons and also with the deep transverse metatarsal ligament now if you trace the laterally we call it as the plantar fascia and it actually covers the abductor hallucis medially and then it merges with the deep fascia of the dorsum of foot and also with the flexor retinaculum laterally if you trace it is actually present over the abductor digiti minimi abductor digiti minimi and merges with the deep fascia over the dorsum of foot but again there is a thickening from the metatarsal to the calcaneum on the lateral side so this medial and lateral parts of this fascia or the aponeurosis is thin and that is why it is actually called as the plantar fascia now apart from that from the edges of the central part you can see septa running deep they are actually called as the medial and lateral intermuscular septum the medial septum attaching to the first metatarsal and the lateral septum attaching to the fifth metatarsal they attach to the first and fifth metatarsal so thereby they divide the muscles of the sole of the foot into a central and then on the sides medial lateral and the central part mostly the muscles are oriented in this way some also there are also transverse septum thereby dividing the muscles into layers we call it as first layer second layer and third layer is because there are also some transverse septum which is given off by the central part of the palmar aponeurosis sorry the plantar aponeurosis i mean to say the plantar aponeurosis now what is the main function of the plantar aponeurosis 
one thing it provides give to the underlying skin second thing it protects the vessels and nerves or the underlying soft tissues third thing it is helpful in maintaining the longitudinal arch of the foot by serving as a tie beam okay so these are the three main functions of the plantar aponeurosis now in lower forms if you look the plantar aponeurosis is actually continuous with the plantaris tendon but here it is not so in course of evolution in man it has separated and it is attached to the calcaneum bone there is no continuation with the plantaris tendon so mainly it protects the underlying soft tissues and also maintaining the arch by a tie beam mechanism longitudinal arch of the foot it helps to maintain inflammation of the plantar aponeurosis is actually called as plantar fasciitis plantar fascia getting inflamed it's actually called as plantar fasciitis it is actually manifested by severe pain in the heel region okay so mainly severe pain in the heel region worse when you walk when you first put your foot off the bed on the ground during morning when you take your first step the play the pain will be worse the inflamed one when it is actually undergoing compression or undue pressure the pain gets worse and and as the day progresses slowly what happens the pain eases but the pain may recur or it might increase based on the activity of for example again for prolonged standing then if it is under constant pressure again what happens is we feel the pain so that is about the plantar fasciitis inflammation of the plantar aponeurosis the main reasons is one is obesity people who are more obese more tend they have to bear weight bearing is more so more pressure is actually given to the plantar aponeurosis then runners okay so those who actually run for a very long period or for a very long distance then naturally their plantar aponeurosis is constantly stretched flat foot when people whose arch is not arched the foot is not arched if it is flat then the whole of the foot is actually touching the ground and plantar aponeurosis is subjected to constant pressure in people who the arches of foot is not well developed in flat foot so mainly these are the predisposing factors for the plantar fasciitis then if your footwear is not proper ill fitting footwear shoes this also might put undue pressure on the plantar aponeurosis now if there is chronic inflammation then the place where it is attached to the calcaneum might get ossified okay and that is called as heel spur or calcaneal spur so that attachment of the plantar aponeurosis might get ossified in chronic inflammation and that is actually called as the calcaneal spur so that is about the plantar aponeurosis and its applied anatomy now we will move on to the muscles of the sole of the foot mainly the muscles are actually present in four layers first layer is actually three muscles are present one to the great toe one to the little toe and one in the middle second layer you have two tendons the long tendons and two muscles which are attached to this long tendons especially the flexor digitorum longus 
third layer is you have again three muscles they are concentrated near the metatarsals they are mainly concentrated near the metatarsals the third layer of muscles fourth layer again you have two tendons mainly your tibialis posterior and peroneus longus muscle followed by that again you have mainly the interosseous intrinsic muscles palmar inter sorry the plantar interosseous and the dorsal interosseous the nerves and vessels of the foot the medial and lateral plantar nerve and the medial and lateral plantar arteries are actually present between the first layer and the second layer the main trunk of these vessels and nerves are present between the first layer and the second layer but the deep branch especially the deep branch of the lateral plantar nerve and the plantar arch the arterial arch is present between the third and the fourth layer so that is how the muscles vessels and nerves are actually arranged in the sole of the foot so now first we will pass on to the first layer of the sole of the foot you have three muscles you are able to see here these three muscles abductor hallucis brevis then you are able to see abductor digiti minimi abductor hallucis abductor digiti minimi flexor digitorum brevis okay mostly the muscles on the medial side mostly not always mostly it will be supplied by the medial plantar nerve abductor the name itself tells it is an abductor of the great toe abductor digiti minimi is actually supplied by the lateral plantar nerve and for the little toe in the midline what you see is the flexor digitorum brevis it is mainly for the flexion of the lateral four toes plantar flexion of the lateral four toes so three muscles for you abductor hallucis abductor digiti minimi flexor digitorum brevis this is calcaneum medial tubercle of calcaneum and that will be the lateral tubercle of calcaneum because these muscles actually originate from that area so flexor digitorum brevis will be the first muscle if you look at the flexor digitorum brevis it actually arises from the medial tubercle of the calcaneum and also from the underlying plantar aponeurosis then it actually divides into four tendons for the lateral four toes each tendon enters the fibrous flexor sheath and then what happens is spirals around the long flexor tendons and then what happens is and finally splits for insertion into the sides of the middle phalanx so actually it is first splitting and then what happens to enclose the long flexor tendons and finally it is attached to the sides of the middle phalanx of the lateral four toes the nerve supply is mainly by the trunk of the medial plantar nerve okay it will be supplied by the medial plantar nerve and the main action is plantar flexion of the lateral four toes okay plantar flexion of the lateral four toes at any position of the ankle joint which means whether the ankle joint is dorsiflexed or plantar flexed it can produce the plantar flexion of the lateral four toes flexor digitorum brevis the next muscle which we are going to see is the abductor hallucis so this is the abductor hallucis muscle which will arise again from the medial tubercle of the calcaneum and from the adjacent flexor retinaculum and from and the plantar aponeurosis then the tendon passes 
medially and is attached to the base of the proximal phalanx it is attached to the base of the proximal phalanx of the great toe supplied by medial plantar nerve that is the trunk of the medial plantar nerve abduction of the great toe away from the second toe okay it abducts the great toe now if you look at the abduction movement this is movement is more pronounced in persons who walk with bare foot or don't wear shoes if you wear the shoes if you look the shape of the shoes the anterior end of the shoes is somewhat pointed or somewhat narrowed or conical in shape whereas our foot is not so now because of that what happens is the great toe is always adducted people who wear shoes regularly constantly for a long period of time so in those persons what happens is this abduction movement is lost okay so the abduction movement for people who wear shoes constantly this abduction movement is mainly lost the next uh, muscle which we are going to discuss is the abductor digiti minimi the abductor digiti minimi arises from both the lateral and medial tubercle of the calcaneum it is actually arising from both the tubercles of the calcaneum and also from the underlying plantar aponeurosis then it passes along the lateral border of the foot and actually what happens is it is inserted into the lateral side of the base of the proximal phalanx same way here great toe proximal phalanx here also what happens to the lateral side of the proximal phalanx of the little toe along with the flexor digiti minimi brevis okay along with the flexor digiti minimi brevis which we will be seeing in the third layer of the sole of the foot now sometimes some of the fibers of this abductor digiti minimi are inserted into the fifth metatarsal okay and that muscle is actually called as woods muscle okay it is actually attached to the fifth metatarsal some of the medial most fibers and it is actually called as the woods muscle now more than a abductor this abductor digiti minimi more than an abductor of little toe it is actually a plantar flexion it brings about plantar flexion and that too again in the people who are wearing shoes constantly because you are all your toes are actually approximated while you wear the shoes so naturally what happens is the abduction component is reduced and it brings more about the plantar flexion and the nerve supply is by the lateral plantar nerve so these two muscles are by the medial plantar nerve whereas the abductor digiti minimi is by the lateral plantar nerve we are moving to the second layer of the sole of the foot second layer you have two tendons two long tendons and two muscles the main muscle you come across is the flexor accessorius or called as quadratus plantae quadratus plantae or flexor digitorum accessorius then you have the lumbricals we are not going to deal with the lumbricals along with the second layer because the second the lumbricals are intrinsic muscles we will be dealing along with the plantar interosseae and the dorsal interosseae so the after, apart from this and you see these two muscles are actually associated with this tendon that is the flexor digitorum longus tendon and one more tendon which you see here is the flexor hallucis longus tendon so two tendons you see flexor hallucis longus and flexor digitorum longus the two intrinsic muscles that is the flexor accessorius and the lumbricals are actually are associated with the flexor digitorum longus tendon so next 
we will see these muscles one by one flexor digitorum longus so the flexor digitorum longus it arises from the posterior aspect of your uh, tibia and fibula posterior compartment of the leg below the soleal line it arises from the tibia it enters the sole by passing deep to the flexor retinaculum deep to the flexor retinaculum and abductor hallucis first layer you have seen that and then crosses the flexor hallucis longus from medial to lateral side crosses from the medial to the lateral side and then what happens it separates into four digital tendons okay it separates into four digital tendons and inserted into the base of the terminal phalanx of the lateral four toes terminal phalanx of the lateral four toes before we have seen flexor digitorum brevis which is attached to the middle phalanx this is flexor digitorum longus which is actually attached to the distal phalanx or the terminal phalanx <laughs> tibial nerve is actually supplied not by the medial or lateral plantar nerve so mainly plantar flexion of the lateral four toes and also plantar flexion of the ankle joint so mainly plantar flexion of lateral four toes and also acting on the ankle joint so that is the tendon of flexor digitorum longus which you are able to see here it is coming via the deep to the flexor retinaculum the next important muscle which we see here is the flexor accessorius or it is also called as the quadratus plantae quadratus because it is quadrangular in shape and it is present on the sole that is why it is actually called as the quadratus plantae muscle so mainly it arises by two heads the two heads you have a medial head and a lateral head medial head is somewhat fleshy and arises from the medial surface of the calcaneum the lateral head is tendinous and arises from the lateral tubercle of the calcaneum okay there is a gap in between these two which is occupied by the long plantar ligament these two unite as a conjoint muscle and it is inserted into the lateral side of the common tendon of flexor digitorum longus it is inserted into the common tendon of flexor digitorum longus nerve supply again it is by the trunk of lateral plantar nerve it is actually the nerve supply is by the lateral plantar nerve what is the main action of the flexor accessorius it see the tendon of flexor digitorum longus is diagonal so when this muscle acts even though there is a plantar flexion of the lateral four toes there will be a diagonal pull of these muscles so to prevent this diagonal or cross action it alters the line of pull okay so that is why it is inserted into the lateral surface so thereby when this muscle contracts the tendon what happens is pulled instead of obliquely or diagonally it is pulled longitudinally in a straight line and thereby it permits plantar flexion of the lateral four toes in any position of the ankle joint okay so that is about the flexor accessorius so straightens the pull of long flexor tendons because this tendon is passing obliquely the next uh, muscle which you are going to see is the flexor hallucis longus the flexor hallucis longus again what happens is reaches the sole by passing deep to the flexor retinaculum then it is present beneath the first layer muscle abductor hallucis and then on the under surface of the sustentaculum talli and crossed superficially by the flexor digitorum longus tendon then 
what happens the tendon passes forwards between the two sesamoid bones of flexor hallucis brevis and finally it is inserted into the base of the distal phalanx of the great toe okay so flexor hallucis longus is inserted into the distal phalanx of the great toe <laughs> is the origin from the posterior surface of posterior compartment of leg and that is the insertion nerve supply is by the tibial nerve and action is plantar flexion of the great toe and it is also helpful in maintaining the medial longitudinal arch so that is about the flexor hallucis longus so the tendon of flexor hallucis longus crossed superficially by the flexor digitorum longus and passes between the two sesamoid bones of the flexor hallucis brevis next uh, coming to the third layer of the sole of the foot they are three in number flexor hallucis brevis then adductor hallucis you are able to see this muscle is actually the adductor hallucis then flexor digiti minimi brevis so three muscles flexor hallucis brevis adductor hallucis and then flexor digiti minimi brevis okay so we will see this muscles one by one the first muscle is the adductor hallucis arises by two head same like our adductor pollicis which has got a oblique head and a transverse head adductor hallucis also arises by a transverse head and an oblique head so the oblique head actually arises on the base of second third and fourth metatarsals second third and fourth metatarsal bones transverse head has no bony origin but actually arises from the deep transverse metatarsal ligament okay from the deep tars deep transverse metatarsal ligaments okay now the plantar arterial arch and deep branch of the plantar nerve lie deep to the oblique head you remember in the first uh, few slides i told you that the deep branch and the plantar arch is present between the third and fourth layer so deep to the transverse head you have the deep branch of the lateral plantar nerve and the plantar arterial arch okay so the transverse head does not have any bony origin both the heads meet and it is inserted into the base of the proximal phalanx of the great toe so it is inserted into the proximal phalanx especially on the lateral side of the proximal phalanx of the great toe two heads inserting into the proximal phalanx nerve supply is by deep branch of lateral plantar nerve deep branch of lateral plantar nerve mainly it adducts adductor pollicis it adducts the great toe towards the axis of the foot axis line which actually passes through the second toe it adducts the great toe the next uh, muscle which we are going to see is the flexor hallucis brevis flexor hallucis brevis it has got a bifurcated tendon which arises from the cuboid and also from the cuneiform bone the lateral band actually arises from the cuboid okay and then the medial band is attached to the three cuneiform bones that blends with the tibialis posterior tendon so it forms a bipinnate muscle which covers the metatarsal metatarsal bone and what happens you are able to see these two muscles are the flexor hallucis bifurcated tendon from the cuboid as well as the cuneiform bones and then what happens is it is inserted like a bipinnate muscle by splitting into two narrow tendons the medial tendon is actually inserted into the medial side of the base of the proximal phalanx along with the abductor hallucis medial tendon inserted along with the abductor hallucis the lateral tendon 
again is inserted in the proximal phalanx lateral side in common with the adductor hallucis so flexor hallucis brief is two tendons lateral tendon and the medial tendon now the tendon of this flexor hallucis is longest largest in a groove of this bipinnate muscle and mainly it produces flexion of the metatarso phalangeal joint of the great toe okay so medial and lateral parts inserting into the medial and lateral side of the proximal phalanx medial one joins with the abductor hallucis lateral one joins with the adductor hallucis in between the groove between the two tendons the tendon of flexor hallucis longus passes nerve supply is by the medial plantar nerve and action is flexion at the metatarso phalangeal joint the next muscle which we are dealing is the flexor digiti minimi brevis so that is the flexor digiti minimi brevis fifth metatarsal bone plantar surface and also from the peroneus longus sheath of the peroneus longus okay from the fifth metatarsal and from the peroneus longus insertion along the under surface of the fifth metatarsal bone and inserted by a narrow tendon to the base of the proximal phalanx of the little toe along with abductor digiti minimi along with the abductor digiti minimi nerve supply is by lateral plantar nerve superficial branch and action it helps in plantar flexion again plantar flexion of the little toe okay plantar flexion of the little toe so we have seen the three muscles flexor digiti minimi brevis before this we have seen flexor hallucis brevis and first muscle of the third layer what we have seen is the adductor hallucis this is adductor hallucis which has got a oblique head and a transverse head these are like bipinnate tendons of the flexor hallucis brevis and this is flexor digiti minimi brevis so in this we have covered the first three layers of the sole of the foot before that we have seen about the plantar aponeurosis which is very very important and can be expected as a short note it gains importance because of its function and also due to its applied aspects then we have seen about the muscles which are present in the three layers okay first layer we have seen about the abductors for the great toe and the little toe and the center what we have seen is the flexor digitorum brevis second layer we have seen two long tendons flexor hallucis longus and flexor digitorum longus two muscles are actually associated with flexor digitorum longus one is flexor accessorius whose function is very important and then we have the lumbricals we have not discussed lumbricals which we will be doing in the second part of this lecture the third layer again we have seen three muscles which are mainly concentrated near the metatarsal bones adductor hallucis flexor hallucis brevis and we have seen the last muscle is the flexor digiti minimi brevis so thank you very much and we will come back again in the second part of the sole of the foot